Hey, Joe, it's an honor to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm going to ask you a couple of rapid fire questions. The first one would be, if you had a chance to change one rule in the state government process, what would that be? Wow. You know, the challenge, <laughs> there, there are so many things in my career, 10 years in state government and now a little over that uh, period of time in lobbying, uh, you know, really the legislative process itself, we have a very antiquated sense of the legislative branch of government in North Carolina. It harkens back to a time when the state was a far more simple enterprise, far more complicated now. Uh, we still do not compense our legislators in a way that would make it possible for them to spend 100% of their mental acuity. And we fully expect them to be subject matter experts on 100% of the things that come before them, very limited individual staff. If I could wave a magic wand and do one thing, it would be uh, modernize the legislative branch of state government in North Carolina. Nice. If you were the governor for five days, what would you do? Boy, only five days? Yes. <laughs> Does it have to be five consecutive days? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Four days and then one day five years from now. <laughs> <laughs> to see what you have done, right? Yeah. You know, in, in a very similar way, the executive branch in uh, North Carolina, you know, we've divided the legislative functionalities over 10 statewide executive branch elected offices, including the governor and lieutenant governor who don't run as a ticket. They're separately elected offices. If, if it was possible over the course of five days to figure out where you could literally reduce the number of people working in state government, but retain, in effect, the, the compensation line item in the budget so that you were able to compense people for skill, ability, and talent, uh, you know, North Carolina's history was, well, you just hired a lot of people to do things in state government, and hopefully you got the least amount of inefficiency and the most amount of output that the people of, of the state would expect. The truth is, the way the economy works now, you may have some really significant subject matter experts that command a much higher salary than would otherwise be available in the public sector. But undoubtedly, if we had a thoughtful approach towards the integration of technology into government, we could run the state of North Carolina with far fewer people and thus less of a retirement liability as well for the state. If it was possible to do that over a five-day period, that's what I would do. <laughs> Very good answer. Can you tell us what everyone has their own superpowers? Can you tell me what is your superpower? <laughs> it, you know, I, I would say it's a, a, a politician once told me that the one thing you can't say about yourself is how modest you are. It's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's very hard to imagine you could articulate what your superpowers are. But I, I would say, I think my inability to find the humor in a moment, I know a lot of experiences in my life politically, having a sense of humor helped de defuse or or uh, ratchet back a, a very tense or or difficult situation. But I think ultimately the the sense of irony that I see in some of the crazy and, and uh, conflicted things that happen in politics, the, the ability to laugh at the absurd uh, probably is the one thing that's kept me on track. I've had a lot of exchanges in my duties as a lobbyist where it, it really was helpful for the legislator to be able to see that the moment was not as significantly poignant as perhaps they thought by me bringing a little levity to the conversation. So if, if I had any superpower, they may be my sense of humor. Nice. What is the one skill you think is essential for anyone to be a good lobbyist? Yeah, you, you know, the one thing it may be just because it's been my experience, but having worked on the electoral political side of things, run campaigns and be in that part of, of the process has a enabled me to better understand when you're talking to a legislator, you're talking to any elected official, ultimately at the back of their mind, no matter what the subject matter is or the context of the conversation, they are thinking about the next election. They're thinking about how they're going to describe what they accomplished, what are the significant reasons voters should return them to that office. In, in understanding, even if you're discussing a matter of public policy, it's not necessarily in the forefront of politics. If you can at least appreciate the fact that that elected official has got to figure out a way to understand what they're going to do on that matter through the prism of the next campaign that they must run, it's helpful for them and they appreciate the fact that you're a sensitive or at least aware of what the political consequences to them from that electoral standpoint are. Hmm. And what would you be if you weren't a lobbyist? 
what would I be? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, when I was growing up, it's funny. When I was growing up, I always said, I either want to be president of the United States or a cowboy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then when Ronald Reagan got elected in my lifetime, I'm like, it's possible to do both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it is hard to say. Actually, my career started, I worked in the development office at my university. And so my real professional beginnings were in fundraising. And I think if I hadn't been lured to work on a congressional campaign at one point and got addicted to politics, I probably would have remained in fundraising in higher education or, or some philanthropic pursuit along those lines and, and enjoyed the things that I've come to enjoy about working in politics, really very similar to what you get out of being a fundraiser. You're actually helping solve a problem. You're figuring out a way for the person to get to the answer yes when they may have not started there. And, and so a lot of the skill sets that were important things I needed to learn to be a, a proficient fundraiser are actually applicable throughout politics, not just in the campaigning part of it, but a, a lot of it is, and, and I always say the most important skill I learned as I learned to be a fundraiser was to be a really aggressive listener, is to really figure out what the person was saying to you that gave you some insight into what you needed to do to construct the argument for their financial support in a way that would resonate with them. And much of lobbying, much of the public policy arena is based entirely on figuring out what it is the, the other side needs to hear and feel strongly about so that they can be committed to a, a solution to the problem that, that everyone can agree on, a consensus point. And a lot of that necessitates really aggressive listening to what they're saying about why they oppose something. Mm -hmm. And what is the one thing very few people know about you? Huh. <laughs> you know, I've it's funny, I've lived a pretty public life and, and uh, have been in the paper a few times favorably and unfavorably. And I always joked whenever whenever there was going to be a, a story run that, that wasn't going to be entirely uh, positive, I would call my father and mother and say, and I just want to give you a heads up, I'm going to be in the paper tomorrow. And my father would always joke and say, well, as long as it's not an obituary. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, yeah. So I, I, I think most, most people know this, although uh, it's one, it's a source of, of interesting pride. I, I play golf as sort of my recreational sport, but I play uh, from a right-handed stance, but play with my hands crossed. I'm a, I'm a right-handed person, but I have a left dominant eye. So when I was growing up, I played baseball. I preferred to hit from the left side just because I was a stronger hitter on that side. My, my left eye is dominant. And, and even though I'm right-handed, it just was a, a more natural stance. And so it was a more natural grip when I took up golf, but I stood on the right side. So it's a, it, it, it is a, a source of great amusement when you play with people to see that. And not many people do play cross-handed like that. And I don't advise it. It, it lessens the, the length of the ball in terms of how far you can hit it. And uh, and I'm convinced when I die and they do the autopsy, they're going to open up my wrists and go, oh, my goodness, what was this guy doing? <laughs> <laughs> but so, yeah, that's probably not a lot of people, although most people finding it out are not surprised. Oh, yeah. Joe Stewart plays cross-handed. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. What is the one thing you want your family to remember about you? Oh, you know, that uh, it, it's interesting. I have a daughter who's 22 in, in this transition into adult parenting where we have more conversations about the, the, the nature of the, li of, of the life on the planet Earth and public policy and other things where it's more of uh, two adults talking than it is a parent to a child. You know, the, the, the lesson that I'm trying to inspire in her, something that my own parents really inspired, is that, is that sense of no matter what you're doing or where you are, you do bear an obligation to try to give back, to try to make the world a slightly better place than you found it. And for me, that's always been uh, finding opportunities to work within nonprofit organizations, in, in part because I have fundraising as a skill. That's, of course, something very useful to most nonprofit organizations. But I've truly blessed a lot of great opportunities, a lot of great organizations that worked on issues, domestic violence issue, helping kids that were emerging from foster care, uh, programs like that, uh, early education initiatives where you really did find yourself as part of a solution to a problem that would make the world a better place for many, many, many people, most of whom would never know that you were involved in it. And enormous satisfaction that comes from that sense of contributing back, of lending your gifts, of lending your skills in a way that makes the place where you live even that much better. That's awesome. Do you have any crazy stories or funny stories you'd like to share um, about lobbying, government, politics, anything like that? 
Yeah, there's two that come to mind. One I think is is very important for people to understand. And in the process of advocacy, in the process of lobbying, many times it's really important to recognize that the very language you use can have a big difference. Back in the late 90s, I worked in the Department of Public Safety. One of the functions in that state agency is the Victims Compensation Program. People that are victims of crime can get money for lost wages or medical expenses and such. And there had been an incident where prior to my time at the department, somebody was robbing a convenience store and the owner of the store pulled a gun and shot the, the robber and the gun the owner had wasn't lawfully registered. And so in effect, the person robbing the store became a victim of a crime at the time they were committing a crime. And so the legislature had said, if you're committing a crime at the time you're a victim of a crime, you're not eligible for this compensation. Well, the director of the program contacted me and said there were instances where in a domestic violence situation, an officer uh, pulled up and the woman in the relationship had been physically abused by the man, but they were living together without the benefit of marriage. And cohabitation is still illegal in North Carolina. The courts have said it's not constitutional. It's still on the books. A man and woman cannot live together without the benefit of marriage. And so in that situation, these women were not eligible for victims' compensation benefits because they were in effect guilty of the crime of cohabitation. And so the director said, you know, we got to do something about this. And I said, absolutely, we're going to do something about it, but that's not the example we're going to use. <laughs> because if we go to the legislature and use that example, the discussion and debate becomes about this issue of it being illegal for a man and woman to live together. I said, I just need a better example. And I said, just, just you know, find me some other situation that we can point to as an example of why we're doing this that doesn't it isn't as likely to incur its own uh, discussion and debate. And he, he came back and said, you know, we've had a situation where a guy was fishing on posted land. No, you know, there was a no trespassing sign, but he was fishing there and he was robbed while he was fishing. And I said, you know, that that's the example we can use. You know, he's just fishing to feed his family and he's a victim of crime. He was committing a crime, but really not relevant to the victimization. So we were able to go to the legislature and get the statute modified. So it says, that the Victims Compensation Commission may deny a claim, a claim if a person is committing a crime, but that they don't have to deny the claim. So we, we solved the problem, but it was in large part because we figured out the best way to describe the circumstances that would not create its own sort of secondary public policy challenge. And so I, I think it's always important going, going into those sorts of initiatives to be aware that the language you're using is important and how you're describing what the problem is is important. And you want to make sure that you're not inadvertently distracting legislators from the primary purpose for the change because of some other sensitivity they have about the example that you've used. And, you know, it's a, the other one is a, my father had a great saying his whole life. He, he was a bowler. He, he bowled in, in sports leagues throughout his life. And he would always say that it's not possible in bowling to hit the pin, all 10 pins with the ball. You have to hit the right two in the right place and they take out the other eight. And many times when you're pursuing a matter of public policy, it's important to spend the time and really consider it may not be that you need to solve all 10 problems. There may be two problems that you actually focus on and resolve that help eliminate the other eight problems. And so any efficiency that you can bring in the debate uh, to why you're pursuing the particular changes that you're pursuing to say to legislators, we think this has the real potential to address other subsequent problems that are created as a result of these situations that we're trying to remedy, that there, there is an important consideration for the efficiency of public policy. Yeah, it would be great if we could, and, and I, the I, uh, example I always use, like, yeah, it would be great if every puppy and every kitten had a warm home, but the expense, the cost, the logistics, the significance of that, per, perhaps it's not possible to have the resources dedicated just for that one purpose, as well intended as that might be. There might be some other things, some other incentives that we could offer to the public that they would take in a puppy or they would take in a kitten. And so I, I think for a lot of groups, the sense is, well, you got to come forward with 10 things in the hopes that the legislature or whatever executive branch you're dealing with would be willing to help you with two. Well, I think it's more valuable for you to have thought through really sincerely which two have the greatest potential to solve the other eight. And so that 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 sensitivity of being thoughtful that that the approach you're taking actually has a benefit that you can describe as one of the points of advocacy for making the change. Nice, very good answer. So, if I had to uh, go back a little back a little bit into your past, did you have um, always this interest in politics and policies? Where did you grow up, and you know how was your childhood like? I mean, did you were you like always this passionate? 
<laughs> you know, it, it's funny. I, I was always involved in student government, never really electoral politics per se. And when I was in college, I ran for student body president. In the year that I ran, there were nine candidates. Uh, and the big issue on campus at that time was that the university had made the decision to enter into an agreement with the food service vendor to require a mandatory subscription to the meal plan. With the food service on campus was not very good and students had complained and the vendor had rightfully said, you know, we don't have any guarantee of revenue. We can't make improvements unless we know we have a certain amount of income. And so it needs to be a mandatory plan for that to work. Well, in advance of running for student body president, I had met with the chancellor, all the vice chancellors, the deans of all the schools, all of the heads of the relevant student organizations. I knew as much about any issue on campus as anyone could. And that sense of preparing myself as a candidate to be thoroughly knowledgeable about all the issues that might come before me as student body president and campaign on that sort of knowledge. And the, of course, the conversations that I'd had about this, the contracts had been entered into, and it was a done deal. The existing uh, agreements were in place. The uh, student body president at the time had agreed. And it seemed to me that the reasonable thing to do was as student body president to make sure that the food vendor lived up to their agreement. So the first candidates forum, nine candidates there, just coincidentally, I was the very last candidate that got asked the first question. And the first question was, what do you plan to do about this mandatory meal plan? And the eight other candidates that went before me all said, you know, I'm going to fight this tooth and nail. There's no way we'll ever have mandatory meal plan on this campus. And it got to me, of course, I had really thoughtfully considered this issue and understood it probably better than any of those other candidates. And I said, the question is moot. They've already entered into the agreement. And it seems to me that the more important thing is that the next student body president hold these food vendors to the their feet to the fire to make sure that they do live up to this improvement in the quality of the food. Well, of course, the next day in the student newspaper, it said, you know, eight candidates will fight the meal plan. Stewart says question is moot. <laughs> <laughs> and rest assured, two things. One, I came in fourth, <laughs> so okay. I was not student body president. And two, the meal plan went into effect. <laughs> that was absolutely right. But the, the reason for telling that story is it was such an important lesson for me that when you are in politics, it is really important to remember it doesn't matter whether or not the voters are thinking through the issue reasonably, you have to be prepared to answer the question in a way that resonates with the voters. And not that you lie or that you don't say what your position is, but I was so convinced that having thought through the issue that I just needed to say what I thought and everybody would buy into it, of course, but people felt passionate. You know, there's a, there's a great saying that all issues are emotional and all solutions are practical. And that's why the process is always political is you've got to match up that sense of people feeling an issue with what practically is possible to solve that problem. And so from that experience, uh, I figured, you know, I would never, never make it in politics. I was a terrible politician and such. <laughs> And, you know, went about the business of, of uh, going to work for the university and raising money and, and had a fraternity brother of mine that was working on a congressional campaign in 1988 and called me up and said, you know, we need somebody to come raise money uh, for this candidate. And I was young, unmarried. And I thought, you know, this would be kind of interesting. I always had an interest in, in government from a student standpoint, but this would be kind of an interesting way to learn about the actual political process. And I fell in love with it. It was great. I love the adrenaline rush of working on a campaign, the constant sense of urgency. Now this is 1988. So it's a very different political environment than the one we have now. I mean, we had uh, uh, one of the practical jokes was you would fax your opponent a roll of toilet paper because you know the thermographic paper came on a roll and it would, it would run through their whole roll. <laughs> you know, I don't even think campaigns don't even have fax machines anymore, do they? <laughs> no one has a fax machine anymore. <laughs> But, but the thing I learned was the skills that I had acquired from that student government experience, getting to know the issues really well, and the lesson I had learned about figuring out what's the right way to communicate it, not just saying what you knew the right thing was, but figuring out the way to convey it, that, that those were great practical skills in electoral politics. And I, and I also began to see really significantly in working on campaigns and then getting a chance to work actually in government, how important, how critically important it is in our system of government for people that can navigate successfully through the political quagmire of electoral politics to find a way to actually be in that role of assuming responsibility for putting in place public policy that does move the state forward, move the nation forward. 
in in uh, the intellectual i mean this sounds sort of self-congratulatory but the intellectual challenge of that of balancing those two ends of this the very passionate part that is politics with the very important and pragmatic part that is public policy that that i always enjoyed figuring out that riddle was always so satisfying and um like at what point did you step into government relations the field itself yeah i um i have it was working uh, at the department of public safety and the secretary then richard moore had decided he wanted, wanted to run for state treasurer in 2000 and i, I ran the campaign for him in 2000 i uh, came in as his chief deputy and then ran the re-election campaign in 2004 and decided you know after about 10 years in state government that it, it seemed like uh you know the the possibility to take what i had learned working in the public sector and apply it made a lot of sense and, and there was at that time being formed a, a new trade association to represent uh, insurance companies large property and casualty insurance companies like state farm and nationwide and such and so i, I knew some of the people that were involved in organizing that and, and it was just at that point uh, you know, Richard was going to go on and run for governor in 2008. And, and um, you know, at that point, I wasn't even sure if, if that ultimately I wanted to continue to work in government in that way. Um, and this opportunity sort of presented itself. And, and quite frankly, a big part of the lure was it was brand new. This trade association had been newly formed. So the the intellectual challenge of getting something up and going and making it from whole cloth into what it needed to be. And quite frankly, Part of it was that, that intellectual challenge. A lot of the companies involved said that the regulatory model in North Carolina was antiquated. It made it very difficult for them to get innovative insurance products to the market here and that they wanted to see a change. And I knew in the, in the context of politics, people very distrustful, many times of regulated companies anyway. They particularly are suspicious that anything an insurance company says would be better from a regulatory standpoint is really only about the in the consumer's mind about a way for the insurance company to charge more for its product and so the, the the prospects of having to figure out a way to solve that problem of dealing with the political realities of people's impression of the industry the fact that in north carolina we have an elected insurance commissioner so it's a very political regulatory environment that that was very appealing it was a it was a great problem to be part of the of a team to solve and so i, I was tempted enough to leave the public sector to do that and have been out ever since. Nice. And um, do you have any, um, what, or let me rephrase the question. What is the best advice you've ever received? Um, and do you have any instances where you actually failed at doing something and what did you learn from it? Yeah, probably the best advice I ever got. John McMillan has passed away now, a long time lobbyist, worked for the law firm of Manning Fulton and had been involved in government and politics in North Carolina for a long time as well, uh, one of the lobbyists for uh, the insurance company, one, one of the insurance companies, Allstate, that was a member of the Insurance Federation, the group that I left the treasurer's office to, to head up. And John had been doing this a long time. And John always said, don't ever get mad. And it seems like <laughs> it seems like simple advice, but it's true. I mean, matters of politics and public policy are very passionate. It's very hard not to feel them at a very personal level. But it, it's also important to remain objective and to not let those passions get in the way of thinking clearly through what alternative solutions there might be. And, and you know this. I mean, it's oftentimes people are in. Uh, opposite camps on a legislative matter. They feel that sense of competition very keenly. It, it is true that they want to win and not lose, and that sort of guides their sense. I, I always joke and say, it, it, at the legislature, at each desk in the House and Senate, they have a green button and a red button. And in truth, it probably would be better if they had a dimmer switch. <laughs> you know, they could say, relatively speaking, how much they were for or against. <laughs> it's very rare that in, in life, things are binary in the way of saying yes or no. I mean, it's just not, yeah. it's not the nature of human existence in many ways. But but John did say you know, it was very important. He'd seen too many times where a lobbyist had gotten themselves too emotionally attached or vested in an issue and a simple solution to the problem was available and they could not see it because they were so upset about what had transpired. And so that that is the best advice is to whatever mechanism or a, a particular thing you have to do to bring yourself back and sort of calm down and reevaluate and, and reexamine an issue. It's really important. I see, I've seen this happen a lot where a lobbyist has just gotten so personally invested 
that they that, that they no longer are able to be uh, solutions oriented. It's all about winning and losing. That's always a problem too. Um, th there there have been a number of times. You know, it's funny. I always joke and say one of the things they teach you in fundraising school is that no means not now. <laughs> and when when you ask someone for money and they say no, what they're really telling you is, well, you just got to figure out another way to ask and come back later to do that. <laughs> yeah, that infatigable sense of what fundraising is all about. Um, I, I would say that there have been a number of public policy initiatives that I've worked on uh, where it it just it just was going to take a while in some sometimes I think in in uh, relative matters. Now, I, I will say I have never been a contract lobbyist. I've only only ever had jobs where I work for a singular entity and I'm much admiration for the lobbyists that have multiple clients and keeping all of that straight and making sure you're not making one legislator mad on behalf of one client that you ultimately need that legislator for some other client. I mean, that is really tricky. That that and lobbyists that work in multiple states. I mean, I'm I'm only smart enough to understand the nuances of North Carolina politics. To have to understand more than one state's politics would be really I'm really impressed by anybody that could can, can, can do that. But I I think that the experiences that I've had were uh I didn't get what I wanted. I wasn't able to be successful initially. The important lesson always was the time is a relevant factor in this. So sometimes you just have to come back at a different time. Sometimes it's that other issues are eclipsing uh, the capacity of legislators to deal with issues. And so your issue, while you know, it's not that people are against it, they're just not a bandwidth necessary to take up the significant complication of whatever your issue is. So I think every time I've had a setback, I've been fortunate to rely on those fundraising skills to say, okay, I don't quit. I just have to figure out what do I need to do to come back and when do I come back to try to be successful the next time. Um, what is the hardest part about your job? Yeah, the, the undoubtedly every lobbyist has a different take on this. I, I think some part of it is, and I do tell my younger colleagues, the important thing to remember is the, the tremendous inefficiency of the legislative process, the very difficult nature of the plotting and the the uh, slow pace and the you know the the relative excessive deliberation on issues and the fact that good things just can't simply be discussed and debated and enacted and, and move on so it's important to remember as difficult as it is to get a good thing through the legislature it's important to remember that it's just as equally difficult to get a bad thing through the legislature. <laughs> and so mm. that's, that's sort of the yin and the yang of that that you have to appreciate. But uh, that, that that undoubtedly, and, and it, it, some part of it too is, I always say, it, it, it was really easy to discuss uh, about the, the necessary changes in steamship safety after the Titanic hit the iceberg. <laughs> There's so many things that should be addressed, it should be evaluated and changed as matters of public policy, but there's simply not a sense of urgency. There's no uh, emergency, there's no catastrophe, there's no significant event that's pointed to say it's cataclysmic and we need to make change now. It would be so much better if you could change policy before there was a crisis to avoid the crisis, but unfortunately just the the way the legislative process works, oftentimes what's necessary is some great terrible example of what the inadequacy of the thing is, and that then the the willingness for legislators to take it up and move forward on it is a little greater. That that's frustrating, but I think it's just the nature of the process. The last question which I have for you before I leave the platform all open to you is: Do you get inspired by policy or politics? Yeah, you know, I, I again, I, I just have been really fortunate to work on uh, a number of initiatives that I feel like did have the result of fixing a problem or making the world substantially or even just modestly better for people that would not have otherwise had that option for improvement uh, absent that initiative. You know, I just can't escape that the politics part of it is fascinating to me. I don't, it, the, the difference is on matters of public policy, it's a little like being a hamster in one of those wheels, you know, and I, I say that the, the important thing to remember about advocacy, generally speaking, is it is very much like the experience of painting the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, by the time you get done, it's just time to get started again. It's like a <laughs> continuum and, and you're never going to be fully done where politics, you know, that that Wednesday after the Tuesday election, it's over. You know, <laughs> you don't have to do it anymore, at least for another year or two. <laughs> and so some some part of what 
makes politics possible to endure is that sense that it is relatively, it's relatively speaking finite, where public policy seems more like it's just an ongoing and, and never ending process. But I do say, I would say this, the, the sense of satisfaction that you have having been part of a winning political campaign still doesn't feel as good as that moment when you're there and the governor is signing the bill into law and it's the complete and total embodiment of everything you had to do to make that <laughs> possible and the recognition that the lives of people you'll never meet that never knew you were working on it that their lives will be better that that sense of satisfaction is greater than even hearing them say on the news that your candidate's projected to win <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome with that we move into the last segment where you get the opportunity to talk anything which i might have missed on any advice you would like to share for the younger lobbyists um, or your future, uh, what does that hold, or your organization itself? Um, the platform is all open. Yeah, there's a, sort of two things come to mind. One, I, I often get asked this question in the trajectory of my, of my career, worked as the executive director of the North Carolina Free Enterprise Foundation, a nonprofit, nonpartisan political research organization, and really the intention was to only ever talk objectively about what the factors were in a particular election or what voter attitudes were, what was in effect, likely to happen as a result of some combination of voter attitudes, the economy, candidates, all those sorts of things. So having to always be focused on presenting information in a most objective way. The, the, the challenge of our politics today, people feel like this is the most derisive time ever in American history. And I don't know, I always say, you know, Thomas Jefferson started a rumor that John Adams was a hermaphrodite. I mean, it's always been kind of a rough and tumble business. I mean, it's not, not any different. It's probably more present. I think social media and the internet makes stuff a lot more available to us than perhaps political content was before. Maybe that makes it seem worse, um, but it's probably not. But the, the one thing I hope that the current political environment doesn't discourage is for people to as a part of their day, make sure they're having conversations with folks they don't necessarily agree with. I mean, I, I will say that the one thing you learn about in doing fundraising is you do have to have conversations, even with people that you may or may not agree with, just because you need to gather the information necessary to make a, a solicitation for their financial support. But it, it did, it did teach me the absolute value of always seeking out folks that you might not otherwise have a conversation with. And in aggressively listening and who, who they are, what their background is, why do they think what they think, and what's the, what's the perspective on the world that they have that you can learn from. And, and I often joke and say that the book that most informs my life starts with the line, George was a good little monkey and always very curious. <laughs> That's really the key to life is just to try the best you can to be a good person and never lose your interest in learning more about the world around you. And that, that's the one thing I hope that our, our political times don't discourage. And, and maybe it's not just the tenor of our politics, but the fact that social media makes it so much easier for people to have mean-spirited discussions, or, you know, not really discussions, but just sort of brain vomits of things that they think are important to say without really being in the presence of the other person and seeing the impact their hurtful world, words are having on them. But in, in part of being a lobbyist is there's a lot of downtime generally speaking, during the legislative process, if you will use those occasions to sit down with other lobbyists, maybe people that you haven't worked with before or know just professionally, but haven't really gotten to know, or even legislators that you don't necessarily get a chance to interact with, given your subject matter, you may or may not get to meet every single legislator. Just that very human communication, back and forth, getting to know each other, expressing what you know about the world and why you think the things you think, it's an incredibly valuable part of the process. You come to see how people develop their attitudes uh, on public policy. It's really useful for that as as well. And you know, I would say I think that the art of of lobbying is is changing a lot too. I mean, the, the technology that's now possible. I, I'm old enough. I can remember my early part of my career. We you know did a lot of direct mail where you sent a letter to people and. You, you were grateful if you got a response rate of 1% or 2%. I mean, that seemed like a really significant thing. And for a legislator to get, you know, a dozen or so written letters on an issue was really powerful. And then email came and legislators being deluged with email. And I think that sort of has, has come and gone to a legislator like, oh, I got 10,000 emails. You know, <laughs> they know that it's automatically generated. I begin to believe 
if a legislator gets one handwritten note from a constituent, they're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> somebody took the time to put pen on a piece of paper. This was a powerful thing for these people. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I think that understanding and appreciating using those technology skills are good. I, I always say it used to be important that you went into a legislative office and you had at least one person who was from that legislator's district. I think it's now possible to say, hey, we're going to leave this meeting and have a communication with every single member of our organization who lives in your district, and we could do that because of technology. So, you know, apply those modern techniques, but but be mindful of the fact, really three things that matter the most about being a uh, being a lobbyist. One is always be honest. You know, I always say you can lie to a legislator once. <laughs> That's going to be the end of it after that. So be, be direct. And also, you know, th that sense of recognize you want the legislator to know why you want them to take a particular position. It's, it's important to have facts and figures. Anecdotes are very powerful too. But it's, at many times I've seen people leave an office and the legislator's like, I don't know if they want me to vote for it or against it. I can't, I can't, can't tell. I mean, make sure you make that clear. And, and the third is to recognize, I mean, that this, there are many times opposite sides to these issues. You don't have an obligation to the opposite side uh, in terms of making the case for them, but it's only fair for a legislator to know if they're likely to hear from someone else. And so it's important, I think, as a lobbyist to at least be mindful of that. If it, you don't want a legislator to walk into something not knowing that they were gonna encounter opposition from another constituency equally as important as the one you're representing. So th th those three things are sort of my, my lessons to the younger generation of lobbyists. Joe, um, that's a great way to end this wonderful conversation. It's an honor to have you on the show. You truly are um, an inspiration for us with the sense of humor and the positive attitude you have. Um, I'm glad that you are a lobbyist in North Carolina. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much. Those are kind words. I really appreciate that. <laughs>